Well, good morning and welcome to our Real Life Christian Fellowship virtual worship experience. Oh, we're so glad to have you. I'm Pastor Leslie Taylor, and I just wanted to welcome each and every one of you this morning to our experience. We are excited about the word today. The message is entitled, Get Ready, A Rock and a Reason. But before we go into this word, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. If you're over on YouTube, I need you to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Yes, and if you're over on Facebook, I'm asking you to like and share this message. A rock and a reason. If you're ready like I am, go ahead and get that pad and that pen. And let's join Pastor Paul L. Taylor Jr., our senior pastor, for the message today, A Rock and a Reason. Good morning, real life. Good morning. How are you? God bless you. We are so glad to be with you all on this morning. God bless you. It is a beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, and we are glad to be alive. It's so good to be with you guys again. So glad that you are here with us worshiping again. To all of you dads, to all of you fathers, we salute you and we wish you a happy, happy Father's Day. I hope that you get your favorite meal and all of the gifts that you have been desiring. I just pray your entire day be blessed. Hint, hint to the family members who are listening to this. Go ahead and bless those dads today because dads are a vital part of the family unit. Fathers, we love you and we thank God for you. Happy Father's Day to you. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you blessed us to see. We thank you, Lord, for another chance, another opportunity. We thank you for another Father's Day. We ask you to bless every dad, every father, every mentor, every grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, cousin. We thank you, Lord, for every man who has stood in the gap to be a blessing to young people, God. We pray, Lord God, for the riches of your blessings upon all fathers and upon all families. We thank you, Lord, for this word today, for this opportunity to share your heart, Lord God, with the people of God. We ask you, Lord God, to make your heart plain and clear to us today. Inspire us, encourage us, and instruct us through the teaching and preaching of your word. We love you, Lord, and we pray, Father, that you would save souls and that you would change lives today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. We're going to go ahead and declare. I'm going to ask you to have your designated declaration leader to stand to their feet so that you can lead your family in the declaration. Are you ready? I hope you are. Let's go. I am the blessed of God, the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower, above only and not beneath. I believe only what the word says about me. The word is my sword and God's plan for my life. I am saved. I am sanctified. I am Holy Ghost filled. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and real life, abundant life. The God kind of life belongs to me. Come on, everybody and rejoice today. Fill up that timeline with your shout emojis because this is who we are in Christ Jesus. We are a blessed people. You got to know that you are blessed people. I want you to always remember that no matter what your circumstances might be, you are a blessed people. Good morning to all of you. I see you in the timeline. Continue to say good morning to one another in the timeline. Greet each other. And let's go ahead and let's get started with this word for today. Our scripture is going to be coming from 1 Samuel 17, verses 50 through 51 in the King James Version. 1 Samuel 17, 50 through 51. Here's what the word of God says. 
So when David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Thank you, Lord, for your word. <laughs> Thank you for what you've inspired through this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to share with you today from the simple topic, a rock and a reason. A rock and a reason. Hallelujah. The rock is what David used to kill the giant. The reason is why he did it. I want to say today that every man needs a rock. Every man, every man needs a rock. That thing that God has developed in him and given him to face the giants of life. Because every man has his giants. And every man needs a reason, a motivation, that thing that moves him to face his giants. What led up to this moment is that the armies of the Philistines and Israel had gathered in preparation for battle. Here's a full description of what took place in 1 Samuel 17, verses 3 through 11, where it says, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. I want you to imagine this. I want you to visualize this moment that the Philistines on one mountain on one side and the Israelites on another mountain on the other side and there's a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with the coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants of Saul, choose a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly defied. Defi uh, excuse me. They were greatly afraid. Let me talk to you for a moment about the giant. They were defeated before they even fought. Israel was defeated before they even fought because fear took hold. The enduring word commentary says that Goliath was possibly between eight foot five and nine foot two. And goes on to say that his armor possibly weighed somewhere between 150 to 200 pounds. I read in some places where the head of his spear weighed somewhere between 15 to 25 pounds. He was not only a big and strong man, but he was a champion, which is defined as a person who defeated his rivals. Yes, Goliath, the giant, was intimidating. 
And our enemy, the devil, still uses the same tactic of intimidation. The Bible says that the devil walketh about our adversary. The devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want to say this to you, everybody, every father and every person listening today. I want to say to you that, yes, giants are intimidating, but they must be faced. This intimidation went on twice a day for a period of 40 days. Every day, twice a day, when the armies gathered together, Goliath would walk on his side. He would shout over and challenge a single man to the battle. Every day, think about it, twice a day, for 40 days, their giant tormented and intimidated them. 40 days of being challenged, and no one, to include King Saul, was willing to face the giant. So what God does, it's God sends David. At some time during all of this, God inspires David's father to send him to the front line with food for his brothers. And when David arrives at the front line, he hears Goliath's challenge. And being told what would be done for the person who kills Goliath and with an exchange with, with his brother, a negative exchange with his brother, David ends up in the presence of Saul, volunteering to fight the giant. Watch God working behind the scenes, everybody. Because David taking his lunch to his brothers was the assignment that led to this assignment. You see, we got to be able to put it all together. And you see the timing of God sending David with lunch for his brothers and to check out on the war and to find out how all was going. Look at the timing of God that God dispatches David to the war site. First Samuel 17, 32 through 37 says, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took the lamb out of the flock. I want you to hear this part. And David said, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Saul, I need you to understand that thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. What David essentially said to the king in this moment is that this is not my first fight. This is not the first time that I've had to go up against an enemy that was bigger than me and that was thought to be stronger than me. But in those cases, I prevailed. And in this case, I will prevail as well. Because the same God that helped me to kill the lion, the same God that helped me to kill the bear is the same God that is going to empower me to kill this giant that stands before us this day. You got to be able to recount the victories that God has already blessed you to have. You got to be able to go back in your mental Rolodex. You got to be able to rewind your tape and be able to see the things that God has already given you the victory over. I wish somebody would go ahead and give God a big old praise right now for every victory he's already won for you. Every way he's already made for you. David said, I am certain that if God did it before, he can do it again. Yes, I want to say to you, David had been training for this day. I said David had been training for this day. The lions and the bears were preparation for this day. I want to talk to you a little bit about David's situation. David was the keeper of the sheep. He was one of the sons. Now, the keeping of the sheep was a job that was normally given to servants, but David was a son. You remember when Samuel came to anoint the new king, David was not even invited to the anointing. 
So some, in some way, shape, or form, David seemed to be slighted and forgotten by his family and perhaps even his father. He was assigned the task that was normally assigned to a servant, although he was a son, but he did it with everything he had. David was so, uh, he had such character that he refused to let a lion or a bear take one of his father's sheep because he had been given the command to keep those sheep. I want to tell you something about David. David did not fight lions and bears so that he could sit down under a tree with the other shepherds and brag about how he had been able to overcome them. But the only reason that he fought lions and bears is because they got in the way of him being able to do his job. I want to say today that if a lion or a bear came to take one of my sheep, they might have had that thing for dinner. I'm going to tell you, if a lion or a bear came and I was keeping the sheep, I might have been going in the opposite direction. You got to be somebody special to take off and run after a lion, to run after a bear. But he was such a man of principle that he would not allow a lion or a bear to take one of his sheep. Yes, he was in training. I know some days it seemed like his job was insignificant. I know some days he wondered why he was the one who had to sit out there in the middle of nowhere watching over sheep, dodging sheep dung, fighting lions and bears. I'm sure that some days he wished that he had a job that was higher up on the totem pole. But what David didn't know is that those days out there watching sheep and leading sheep was going to prepare him to lead people. That those days of fighting lions and bear to protect the sheep was going to prepare him to fight this giant. I want to say to you that what you're doing today is preparation for something major that God is going to release you into in your future. Somebody shout hallelujah. Everything you're doing has a purpose. It has a reason. The experience that you have gained and the lessons that you've learned, God is going to use those one day. I'm telling you, he's going to use those one day and you will be glad that you went through what you went through. You'll be glad that you had that experience. You'll be glad that you learned that lesson. I want to say to you today that you, just like David, have been in training. Let me reiterate that it takes something special. For a man to make him fight wild animals. Take something special to make him do it. But no wonder God gave him for this, chose him for this task. Because David was a special man. David was a man with principles. So Saul, he does what makes sense to him. And he gives David what he fought with. But David was not able to fight in what Saul fought with. Can I say to you today that when you're facing your giants, that is not the time for you to be trying out new stuff. What you're going to have to do is go with what has worked in the past and has proven itself effective. So David takes off Saul's armor and he lays down Saul's sword and he picks up what he's familiar with. Remember at the beginning of the sermon, I said that every man has got to have a rock. Every man has got to have that weapon that he wars with and that he fights with that has defeated other enemies in his lifetime that will also defeat this giant. If your weapon is praise, if your rock is praise, then you should praise. If your rock is prayer, then you should be a prayer warrior. If your rock, come on, y'all, is, 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 is reading the word and speaking the word, then do that. If it is worship, then do that. But what I'm telling you is that what worked in the past will work in this case as well. First Samuel 17 and 40, it says, and he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, what everybody else ran from, David moved towards. And the Philistine came, verse 41, and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, he saw David and disdained him because he was a youth. And he was ruddy, and he was a fair countenance, which means he was young and good-looking. 
And the Philistine says, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? Did you come to me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. But listen to what David says, not even intimidated. These trained soldiers would not even go toward Goliath. But this young teenage boy with the anointing of God on his life stands up and he says, thou coming to me with the sword and the spear and with the shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of the. Um, excuse me, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He said, this day the Lord will deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee and I will take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Look at David giving his reason for fighting. David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And I tell you what, you defied God when you defied his army. When you come against God's people, you come against God. And so David said, I'm going to kill you and God is going to deliver you into our hands. Look at verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I want you to use your visualization again to see this, this giant that's almost 10 feet tall with 200 pounds of armor on him running toward David to engage in battle. They are running down into the valley to meet one another to engage. And this young teenage boy is running toward, listen, running towards this giant. And as he's running, David put his hand in his bag. And he took dents of stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. So that the stone sunk in his forehead and he fell upon his face on the earth. Some commentators hate harking back to when the, they put the Ark of the Covenant next to the God Dagon. And when Dagon, they came back the next morning, Dagon was laying on his face. And here we see a servant of Dagon laying on his face. Think about this for just a moment. The power of God, when this young man faced his giant, enabled him to sling a stone with such accuracy and such velocity that the stone struck him in the center of his forehead and it sunk into his forehead. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about the power that God gives to us as we face our giants. I want to say to you today that if you have some giants that you're facing in your life, the giants of financial problems, the giant of marital problems, the giant uh, of health problems, the giant of problems on your job, the giant of problems, come on, y'all, in your spirit and in your mind, I want you to know that as you stand up to face your giant, that the God of heaven will enable you to defeat and to overcome your giant, but you got to run towards it and not run away from it. He went into his bag. I like that part. David went into his bag. David did what David always did out there in the wilderness, practicing with his slain, getting his accuracy to high levels, perfecting his gift out in the wilderness with no one looking. He had no idea that this day would come. But every battle that you won in your life, Every victory that you won in your life, every obstacle that you had to overcome in your life has equipped you and prepared you for this. So David prepared over the he prevailed over the Philistine, y'all. With a sling and a stone. And he smote the Philistine and he slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. So David ran. And he stood upon the Philistine. I want you to think about this now. 
The Philistines laying on the ground. Stone lodged in his forehead. And David goes over to him to make sure he's done. And he pulls out Goliath's sword. Now, 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 hold, 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 hold a minute, hold a minute. The head of his spear is somewhere between 15 to 25 pounds. And this young boy pulls out the giant sword and slays him and cuts his head off. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. He took care of his giant. His reason was for God's honor and for God's glory. His reason, the reason the reason, every man's got to have a reason to face his giants. David's reason was for God's honor and God's glory. He said it several times in verse 26. He referencing, he references taking away the reproach from Israel and that Goliath had defied the armies of the living God. In verse 36, he mentions again that Goliath had defied the armies of the living God. In verse 45, he tells Goliath that he comes against him in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And finally, in 45 and 46, he says, This day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee. He said, I will take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines to the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth. Listen to what he says, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. He did it for God's honor and for God's glory. But he also did it because he said the whole earth needs to know. That there is a God in Israel. And he also did it so that all of this assembly would know that God does not deliver with the sword and the spear because the battle is the Lord. And he will give you into our hand. Can I tell you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The battle that you fight, it belongs to God. The battle is not yours. That's why you can face your giants because it's not up to you to win, but it is up to God to win for you. All you got to do is make your move to face what it is that has been intimidating you and God will give you the victory. You got to trust God in the battles that you're, wa you're waging. The spiritual battles that come to intimidate you and to make you miserable and to steal your joy and to steal your lives. Stand up in the name of the Lord, war through prayer, war through fasting, war through worship, war through praising, war through speaking the word of God. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God will win the battle because God is fighting for you. It wasn't David that lodged that stone in the giant's head. It was the power of God. But God used what David had. David had five stones and he had a sling and he had a skill of using that slingshot. But God used what David developed when nobody was listening, when nobody saw him, when he seemed insignificant. I want to let you know that God is going to use what he gave you. <laughs> In those times when you wondered, why am I going through this? Why is life going this way for me? God is developing you and he's developing something in you. Let me tell you what was at stake as we close. The freedom of his people. The freedom of his people. The giant said that whoever wins have to become the servants of the winner. So if Goliath had won, Israel would become the slaves of the Philistines. 
See, when you stand up against those giants, you are fighting for the freedom of your family. We will not be slaves to the enemy. We will not be slaves to sickness. We will not be slaves to depression. We will not be slaves to anxiety. We will not be slaves to poverty. We will not be slaves to bad marriages. We will not be slaves to sickness. We will not be slaves because we are going to fight in the name of the Lord against every demonic spirit that comes against our family, that comes against our minds, that comes against our bodies. We are going to stand in the name of the Lord and we are going to overcome everything that the devil throws at us. We're going to overcome it. He was fighting for their freedom. Brothers, when we war in the spirit, when we get up in the middle of the night and we pray for our family, when we get up in the morning and we pray for our children and for our wives, when we lay hands on our family, when we declare that our household will be blessed, we are fighting for the freedom of our family. The devil will not rule in our house. Our home is a place where the spirit of the most high God dwells and his blessing resides here. Come on, men of God, jump up on your feet and say, I will stand up to my giants. I will not have let the devil have my family. I will not let the devil have my children. I will not have the devil let the devil have my joy. I will not let the devil have my peace. Come on, somebody shout today. We can win, but we got to use our rocks. Yeah, prayer, praise, worship, the word. Fasting. <laughs> yeah, those are the weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, y'all. But I will tell you what, they are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. God's weapons work. So use what God gave you. Hey, use what he gave you when you were in a dark place. Use what he gave you when you thought that that sickness was going to take you out. Use what he gave you when you were going through hell and didn't know how you were going to make it out if the Lord didn't move on your behalf. Use what God gave you. I got to calm down. I got to calm down. Use what he gave you. Use those scriptures he spoke to your spirit. In the middle of the night. Use the scriptures that he had you turn to when you didn't know where to turn. Use what God gave you. He was fighting on behalf of others. And I want to say this to y'all. If we don't face our giant. They will remain for the next generation to face. If we don't go ahead and take these giants out. They're going to hang around. And the next generation is going to have to fight what we should have faced. There is a spiritual warfare being engaged. The enemy is coming at us from all sides. And we, as the people of God, have got to make our stand. So God calls for a David that had been groomed in the background. <laughs> Hallelujah. And this David, whom God groomed in the background, stood up on behalf of the nation. And he defeated the nation's giant. Men of God, we're called to be the priest of our household. We are the men who war in the spirit on behalf of our family. No enemy will get our family. No enemy. Come on, y'all. Somebody shout no enemy. I need the brothers to stand up on your feet with me today, and I need you to declare, I will stand and I will fight in the spirit for my family.
I will pray for my family. I will fast for my family. I will anoint my family. I will declare and decree the word of God over my family, over my household in the name of Jesus. I will be who God called me to be. Men of God, you are significant. Dads, fathers, you are significant and you are important. And I thank God for you. I thank God for you being stand up men. I thank God for you being there and looking out for your families spiritually, financially, emotionally. I thank God for you, men of God. And I encourage you, don't give up. Don't give in. You keep standing. You keep fighting in the spirit. Knowing that the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's, and he will deliver your giants into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody, rejoice today. Giants might be intimidating, but giants fall. Giants might be intimidating, but I'm telling you, giants do fall. The giants on your job, the giants in your health, the giants in, your, in, in, in the household, the family dynamics, the issues of life. I'm telling you, these things are not able to defeat the God you serve. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. We love you and we give you praise. I pray, God, that I have been able to relay to your people what you share with me. I pray, God, that it was clear I pray that it was encouraging. I pray that it was a blessing for that person who's facing giants today. Who has things in their life that seems to be overwhelming them right now in this very moment. And they're wondering how they're going to make it, how they're going to get through. Today, they just heard the word of God that reminded them that the weapons of their warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. They are mighty. They are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds <laughs> and the toppling of giants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, spiritual warriors. <laughs> God bless you, men and women of God. I pray that you defeat your giants, and that you win your spiritual victories. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time for us to offer salvation for any person today who might not be saved. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today, I want to offer you that opportunity to come to know him. Would you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, Please forgive me for every sin I've committed against you. I repent of everything I've done that was against your will. Lord, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I also confess and believe that he died on the cross of Calvary to save me from my sins and that you raised him from the dead and he is alive seated at your right hand, making intercession for me. Your word said that if I did that, that I would be saved. And by faith, I believe that I am. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to please text the word salvation to 912-325-9952. Five nine. Text the word salvation to 912-325-9959. If you do that, you will receive a link. It has a form that we ask you to please fill out. There's information on that form about the decision that you made today. But there's also the opportunity, if you would like it, for you to have one of our elders ministers or deacons to contact you to give you support. All you have to do is check that box and say yes. Someone will contact you and give you support in your new life in Christ. Welcome to the body of Christ. It's time for the Holy Communion. I hope that everyone has their sacraments prepared. Today we celebrate 
the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary to save us from our sins. As I studied this message, it says that in the Hebrew, the word champion meant middleman, which was the man who fought on behalf of another, which would have made David the middleman for Israel. But we had a problem called sin that we were unable to defeat on our own. And Jesus defeated sin on our behalf. <laughs> sin was our giant, y'all. And we could not overcome sin on our own. And we thank God for the sacrifice of Christ to overcome the giant of sin on our behalf so that we might be saved. He that knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul writes about the Holy Communion in, where, in which he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He said, Therefore, who eats and drinks this bread, eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. But he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many asleep. Father in heaven, we pray today that you would forgive us for any and every sin that we might have committed against you. We declare that we are sorry for the wrongs that we've done. We ask you to forgive us and to bless us today as we receive the supper, as we commemorate the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross of Calvary for our redemption. We ask you to bless these sacraments that we have prepared, the bread or the crackers, the juice. Bless them and take them now from a carnal and physical use to now a spiritual use and purpose. And bless us as we receive it on today. We do this all for your glory in remembrance of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. On that night, Jesus took bread. He broke it. He passed it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take ye and eat. Let us eat together. In like manner, he took the wine, he poured it, he passed it to his disciples. And he said, take ye and drink. Let us drink together. And after they had had the supper, the scripture said that they sang a hymn and went out into the Mount of Olives. We don't have a Mount of Olives, but we do have our homes, our communities, our places of work. Let us share with them that Jesus still saves to the glory of God, the Father. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for worshiping with us and celebrating the Lord's Supper with us. Thank you for being a part of this worship today. I have an announcement that I'd like to make before we go, and I'd like to tell you about the brand new Real Life Podcast. We have a podcast. Come on, everybody, and celebrate that today. It is called the Real Life Podcast, where our life in Christ is the topic of discussion. All you have to do is go to your app store and download the Podbean app and search for the Real Life Podcast.
to hear our first episode featuring Elder Joe Johnson Jr. entitled, It's Our Turn Now. Check that out. It will be a blessing to your life. You can also go to our website at reallifeptwentworth.com. We have a podcast page there. You can listen to the podcast from our website as well. Well, thank you all once again for being with us. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless all of you fathers, fathers. Happy Father's Day to you. I pray that all of you have an amazing and enjoyable day. Well, on behalf of myself, Pastor Leslie, and our leadership team, I would like to say God bless you and stay safe. And now I speak the blessing of God over the people of God, the blessing that makes rich and you add no sorrow with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay tuned. Pastor Leslie is going to come and thank you for worshiping with us. And there will be some announcements to follow. Have a great week. Didn't I tell you that was going to be a word from the Lord? Oh, my God, a rock and a reason. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to put that word into action. Again, thank you for joining us for the Real Life Christian Fellowship Virtual Worship Experience. And thank you for sharing the word of God with all that you come in contact with by liking and sharing today's message. We are Real Life Christian Fellowship Church, where we introduce the kingdom, change generations, and create a Christian culture. We'll see you next time.